welcome. My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted that you've joined us for today's program on the inspirational story and film, The Albanian Code. What a story we have for you today. So today we have three speakers. Our first speaker will be Dr. Mordechai Paldiel, who is our resident historian on the board of directors of the Sousa Mendes Foundation. He was for 24 years uh, at Yad Vashem as the director of the Department for the Righteous. And in that position, he was the first to honor the Albanian rescuers on behalf of Yad Vashem. And that's part of what he will tell you about today. Our second speaker will be the filmmaker, Yael Katsir, of the beautiful film that you saw. Now we've had Yael in the past, we showed another film of hers called Shores of Light, telling the inspirational and really beautiful uplifting story of a DP camp in Southern Italy where Jewish Holocaust survivors started again, started their lives again, right after the Holocaust. And Yael specializes in just glorious, uplifting Jewish stories. Our third speaker is named Saimir Lolia. He's a professor in Toronto, Canada. He's an Albanian Canadian man. And he has specialized in the story of the rescue of Jews by Albanians during World War II. And he will tell you about the meaning of the profound concept of Bessa that we hear about in the film. And he will also tell you some individual stories of rescuers and the Jews that they, that they rescued. So let's start with Dr. Paul Diel. Mordechai, how are you today? Okay, so I will speak about a little bit of the history of Albania. Uh, it's a very old country. Uh, the word Albania uh, derives from uh, an old uh, tribe uh, by the name of Albani. Uh, some historians say the name was Arbeni. Uh, today, the Albanians call themselves not Albania, but they call themselves Shkiperi. Uh, Shkiperi in, other, in the Albanian language means the land of the two eagles, the two eagles. But that is the symbol of Albania, and that is the, the two eagles that have, appear on the Albanian national flag. So if you look at the Albanian national flag, you will see two eagles, and that is the uh, emblem of Albania. So I'm, I'm beginning here now. You see Albania is a very small country, surrounded by other small countries, Montenegro, Kosovo, Serbia, Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Greece. But then on the other map on the right, you see that there was another big, large country, Turkey. And I'll come to that later because Albania was for 500 years part of the Turkish Empire. But I'm going back now to the history, uh, to the Roman history. Next. Uh, most of Albania is a mountainous country. Uh, a lot of uh, hills and valleys. And, and, and that made it very uh, convenient, if I can use the word convenient, for Jews who try to hide uh, because of the mountainous uh, topography of Albania. But there is also a different Albania. Next, Tirana is the capital of Albania. It lies on the Adriatic Sea. It's today, this is a picture from a recent picture. It didn't look that modern uh, 50, 100 years ago, but that is now the capital of Albania. And this is where the government uh, functions. And this is where the government is located. Next. And this is uh, one of the remains of a Roman amphitheater. Wherever the Romans came, they, they built amphitheaters and theaters. Uh, if you remember the film Ben-Hur, you remember the chariot race. Uh, so that was in, through the old Roman Empire. So wherever you see uh, this uh, type of an amphitheater uh, in, a, in any part of Europe, or even North Africa, then you know that the Romans were there. Next. Now, uh, at the beginning, the Albanians were, were Christians, but then the, 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 the Ottoman Empire expanded uh, into the Balkans and they conquered Albania. Albania resisted and the most uh, celebrated hero of Albania is a man by the name of Skandberg, Skandberg, and he fought off the Turks and he kept them at bay and he defeated one army after the other until finally uh, they had to surrender to the Ottomans and Albania became 
a province of the Turkish Empire. But to this day, everywhere you go in Albania, you have these bust uh, statues of Skanderberg, the hero. You see the date on one of them, 1405, 1468, in the 15th century. That's when the Albanians fought back against the Turks. So they have a history. They are, uh, they are a warlike people. They know uh, they're very proud of themselves and they like to defend themselves. And they did that uh, during that part of their history. Next. Now, in 1911, Albania became an independent country. And some years later, after World War I, they even uh, consecrated a king. He was, uh, his name was Zog or Zogu. Uh, he was the only king of Albania because uh, in 1939, the Italians conquered Albania. But he was very friendly to the Jews. There were at that time between 200 and 300 Jews. He uh, instructed the ambassador in Berlin to issue transit visas and to issue visas to Jews who were trying to get out of Germany and Austria. I'm talking about the 1930s before World War II broke out. And so many Jews made that passage in Albania on their way to other destinations. So he was very friendly to Jews. And, uh, but there were Jews living in Albania even before that. But then uh, hundreds and hundreds of Jews, nobody has the exact statistics, uh, went, came to Albania and then they continued to other destinations uh, depending on the visa that they had. Uh, this is in the 1930s. Next, please. Now in 1942, we are in World War II and I'm showing you a copy uh, that was presented before the top echelon of the Nazi government in Berlin. It's known as the Wannsee Conference. Wannsee is the name of the boulevard in Berlin where the conference took place on January 20th, 1942. And at that conference, the, uh, those who were assembled were given a diagram showing how many Jews there were in Europe that needed to be eliminated under the code word, the final solution. You have the total figure of 11 million. But very interesting, when you come to Italy, here is uh, Italy, and it says Italy, including Sardinia, 58,000. And underneath that is Albania, because Albania was already part of, I mean, the Italians had conquered Albania, only 200 Jews. Actually, there were 300 Jews. But to the Nazis, that was very important. They had to have all the Jews of Europe included for the final solution. But, the Italians were then in control in 1942. Uh, and uh, in 1943, when Italy capitulated in September 1943, the Germans took over whatever the Italians had controlled before. So the Italians ruled Albania for four years. And then the Germans came in and they, and they were in control of Albania for a little bit over a year. And the Italians did not persecute the Jews. Jews did not have to go into hiding. Uh, but when the Germans came in, that was a time when most Jews, in fact, all Jews who were in Albania had to look for themselves. And this is where the Albanians, again, I have to mention Albania is mostly a Muslim country. It became Muslim under Turkish rule and the Turks were there for 500 years. So under the German rule, most Jews had to go into hiding. And that's the story that we will hear more later on. Next, please. At the end, uh, in November 1944, the Germans withdrew from the Balkans. And then there was uh, already an underground, which was led by Enver Hoxha. There was another underground. Uh, there were two undergrounds. Enver, Enver Hoxha uh, led a communist underground. The others were the nationalists, where the communists overpowered the nationalists. And when the Germans uh, withdrew, Enver Hoxha established a communist rule in Albania, which lasted for 45 years. Next. Now, this is a mural. This is the mosaic of a mural during the communist period. It's very interesting. Uh, you see how they depicted uh, the history of Albania uh, as though everything in the past history led up to these three figures up in front uh, who established the communist rule. And very interesting, you have a woman that is holding a rifle. Uh, well, they, uh, 
I guess the, they, they were very brutal, the communists, but they liberated the women and they gave the women uh, equal rights. But they were very extreme. It's one thing which uh, today strikes the fancy of everyone who studies communist rule in Albania is Albania proclaimed itself the only atheistic state in the world. In other words, they said religion was bad and uh, it was best for people to forget about religion. So they persecuted people of the Islamic religion, of the Christian religion. There, were, there was a small minority of Christians and also Jewish religion. So they didn't allow any preaching, any synagogues, any mosques. For 45 years, it was forbidden to practice religion. So they were even stricter than what was in the Soviet Union. Uh, next. Uh, well, Hadja, the dictator, didn't get along, with, not with the Soviet Union and not from uh, nearby Yugoslavia, which was also a communist country. His closest ally of Albania during that period was uh, a communist China, was Ma Mao Zedong, but that's very far, that's thousands of miles far. And so uh, they were very paranoid, the Hadja regime. And they were afraid that Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, they were going to invade Albania and uh, recreate it as a more moderate communist state. So they created these bunkers all across Albania. They are, nobody knows the exact figures, bunkers stretched along the frontiers of Albania uh, in order to face an invasion by another communist country, which of course never happened. In 1989, uh, Hajar died. Communist regime lasted for another two years. And in 1991, communist rule was over in Albania. And uh, now I turn the floor over to uh, Yael Katsir, the producer of that wonderful film showing uh, the people, some of the people that the Albanians saved. And so, Yael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to speak to people in the US. And I've, not, I've been not only the producer, but also the director of this film, which is a kind of a little bit different. We worked on the film for three years. And I want to say that uh, we start, I started the whole thing from, it, from Southern Italy because about 2,000 families were given permission to go to Italy by the Italians when they have recuperated uh, to the allies. And so uh, when I discovered it, I, I felt that I must do this film and I started to study and uh, Professor Samuel Lolia has helped me a lot in all. I want to say that uh, I was very lucky because I met one of the last survivors uh, who were saved in Albania. And when Annie came to my house the first time, she came with her daughter and uh, all of a sudden she saw the photograph of my father on, uh, on one of the shelves. And she said, what Professor Abau, uh, he was from Germany, my father, he escaped the Nazis uh, in due time. Uh, what is he doing, Yael? You know that because of him, I have two wonderful girls and he operated on me when I was a soldier. And from that moment, she, we became such, cooperated so much for her. The most important thing was to go back to Albania after many years when she couldn't go back because of, uh, because of her job. She, to go back and to say thank you to whoever she could say thank you. And one morning she disappeared and she entered the school opposite our hotel and she just jumped on the children and I, I called the photographer, come, come, run after her, run after her. And he photographed her when she said, I just want to thank all the Albanians for saving my family during World War II. And, and, it was, and she was crying and she sang with the children the uh, Albanian national item, which she remembered from the time uh, that she was in Albania. I want to say that for me, this was a special uh, human experience to be in Albania, to meet the Albanian people, to see how hospitable they are, 
how human they are and to appreciate their courage in saving so many people. And they saved not only the Jews, they saved also Italians who were their uh, rulers. They were the occupiers of their country just the day before. And the family of Samir Lolia uh, had, uh, had the experience with one of the Italian soldiers. And the children of this Italian soldier, because he had died already, came to the first screening in Albania last year. Uh, I want to say that uh, I have, because it is unknown to so many people, we have to speak and tell it and repeat it all the time, because this is a unique example of a small people who is a great people who saved so many people just because they were persecuted and needy. This is what I have to say. And now I would like to turn the, the speaking, the torch of speaking to Professor Saimir Lolia, uh, who at the moment is a professor of mathematics in Canada. Please, Saimir. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, everyone for this invitation and this occasion to speak about something good, an example that is valid today, it was yesterday and should be a value, a positive value even for the future. The film by Yael Kazir is about salvation. The main part is the salvation of Jews. And the second part is the salvation of uh, Italian ex-soldiers. At the root of salvation was Besa. Now you will hear something, a uh, simple description about Besa and then further information about uh, salvation of Jews and Italians. Besa is a, like a faith for Albanians. It's beyond the oath to self and others. It is a moral code of noblesse oblige. It is an instituted norm of social behavior. It is an ancient tradition of trust and integrity. When it is given, it is never sold. It is sacred by canon, the ancient protocol written for the Albanian society where only the concept of the guest does exist, not that of the foreigner. Besa is a motivation. It's like a compass for acting. It has two parts. One part is the emotional part. It contains honor and shame. And it is also a reason why. And that reason can be further explained by saying that Besa is another example of the golden rule, the ethic of reciprocity. Treat others the way you would be like to be treated. It confirms salvation, the rescue of those in need. It is a belief in a precise understanding and virtue, honesty and mutual respect. It helps others to convey Besa and be guided by virtue. It's a compass. Another, for instance, another example of the golden rule is the great principle in Talmud, that which, that which is hateful to you, don't do to your fellow. Now let's move to the second part. What are the particularities of uh, salvation? Uh, by list that I prepared, there are at least 3,280 Jews that were saved during the Holocaust. All Jews, most of them were not Albanian citizens and were saved. The number of Jews tenfolded at the end of uh, war. The rescue was a combination of governments, population, all faiths, and for the time when Italians were the top authority, we would say that Italian authorities were also sought. The salvation was not sold. The salvation was total, national, from all governments and faiths, 
as an entire national culture. The salvation was nonstop, meaning that no matter how long, when they came, how many they were, and where they stayed, the salvation was carried out. The peak of salvation was between September 1943 and November 1944, where in parallel, more than 20,000 Italian ex-soldiers were also hiding and living with Albanian families. Jews and Italians did not suffer, but they got concealed, cared off, lived with others like, I, like others. The story of salvation of Jews uh, flew for the first time out of Albania in June 1990 when uh, US Congressman Tom Landos and US ex-Congressman Joe Duvardi visited Albania and met the Albanian president, from whom they received a thick dossier of censored letters that saved Jews had mailed to their saviors in Albania. With, because Albania was a hermetic, close country under a government which followed a Slavic communist rule. And with that uh, thick dossier, they sent it to Yad Vashem. And that uh, thick dossier of Chancellor Leder made the foundation for Harvey Sanner to publish the first book in this subject in 1997. Race in Albania, 100% of Jews say. This is the first book. In particular, after 2000, more and more people are working, studying, doing PhD, producing films, conferences, and so on. And the story began to, to open. Uh, since Albania was a closed country, the story of salvation was also a closed thing. Therefore, after 1991, when it was the first nomination of righteous among the nation, uh, Yad Vashem could award this title to only 69 Albanians instead of 100. And now there are some slides, simple slides, that my friend and colleague, Apostol Katani, had gathered them about 40 years ago. At that time, the stories were transmitted like whispers and from hand to another hand, tell him this were this and their people were making some notes and marks on the pictures. So you can see here, for instance, this is a Jewish family, uh, grandmother, mother and uh, son staying at a family in Elbasan. So these uh, pictures, uh, photos are about 40 years old. Next, please. Uh, this is another picture, of, uh, two photos with uh, Johanna, who, as you can see here, in a very touching moment, she met after 60 years her savers. I have uh, communicated with Johanna. She has passed away some years ago now. Next, please. And here is Rafael Faragi, who is uh, telling as a recognition the picture of his, uh, of his uh, race group because he was part of a 26 uh, member family that stayed for more than a year at the house of Mefail Bichaku in a village in Librash in Albania. Next, please. And here is another picture where you see many children that are keeping in the center two sisters, Lucy and Corey Haim, who were part of a seven members family from Corfu that stayed in the house of Angel Vitri in Salve Quartet in Cavalli, Albania. As you see, they are all playing together, smiling together, doing everything together. Next, please. And here is another picture. On the right, you have the saviors the couple of Destan and Limabala from Shengerj, it's a 
village near Tirana, in fact, after the mountain. And on the left, we have two old couples, Shlomo and Mordecai Lazar, who were saved during the war in the family of uh, Desan and Lima Bala. And in 1992, they sent this picture. Now they had an expanded family. They sent their uh, picture to their saviors. Thank you. Next, please. And here is another picture. Shmuel Doritza is the couple, and Bina is the small girl. Uh, they came in 1941 to Hotel Daiti, where Mesut is working there. He made him find a job, having other identities on documents, and placed in a safe uh, house. However, for safety reasons, the couple had to move to another location and they left the small daughter, Bina, four years old, to the family of Mesut. And uh, they raised it, made, made her uh, learn Albanian, gave her another name, Tsuzi, as you see it's here on bracket. And in the end of the war, they united again and went uh, back to Yugoslavia. After many efforts, they communicated again. And as you see here, they are reunited in 1993 in Israel. I know these people, Preskita and her brother Admir are my friends and uh, neighbors here in Toronto. Thank you. This is a set of uh, pictures in support of the content of excellent movie by Yael Katsir. Thank you, we maybe talk later more. Uh, please, Mordecai, can you add something? Okay, so I worked at Yad Vashem as the head of the Righteous Among the Nations Department. And uh, I was there since 1982, and I was wondering how come nobody is talking about Albania and about the people, the Jewish people that were saved in Albania. And finally, of course, as was mentioned, there was a, a communist regime. Albania was closed to the whole world. But finally, it opened up in 1991. And the first Albania that was honored by Yad Vashem was Refik Vesely. And he came to Yad Vashem here in 1991 with his wife sitting next to him. And uh, when people applauded him, he raised his hand. I was there. I gave him the certificate of honor. I gave him the medal. Uh, on the picture here on the left uh, is the vice chairman of Yad Vashem, Ruven Daphne. Now, I want, to I want to tell you what his wife, Drita, said about Refik. Refik died a few years after this picture was taken. She said the following. My husband, Refik, was a photographer. He had learned his trade as a teenager from a Jewish photographer by the name of Mandil, who originally lived in Yugoslavia before escaping to Albania. When the Germans occupied Albania, my husband got his parents' permission to hide all the four members of the Mandel family and four of their cousins in the family's home in the mountain village of Kruja. All eight Jews were hidden until the liberation. My husband and his parents, Fatima and Vessel, Vesely, were the first Albanians to be recognized by the state of Israel as righteous among the nations. When my husband was asked what made it possible for so many Albanians to help and protect Jews, he said that there are no foreigners in Albania. There are only guests. Our moral code as Albanians require that we be hospitable to guests in our home and in our country. Our home is first God's home, second, our guests' home, and third, our family's house. The Quran teaches us that all people, Jews, Christians, Muslims, are under one and the same God. Next. So, I met this photographer, Norman Gershman, an American photographer who roamed across the whole world taking pictures and I I convinced him to go to Albania and take pictures of many of the Albanians who saved Jews. And uh, 
he also published uh, he also published albums of many of the Albanians that were honored from Yad Vashem and those that were still in the process of being honored. And here he uh, receives a certificate from the state of New York in Albany from the assembly, which honored him for bringing the story. He went around and talked about Bessa and about the Albanians and the message of what the Albanians did uh, soon became a household name across white circles in the United States. So this is a picture from 2008, 15. He has since passed away. Next, please. Uh, here is another Albanian, Eddie Pilku, uh, and he is holding the Yad Vashem certificate of honor and his, what, and his father. His father is the man that was honored by Yad Vashem. And this is what Edip said. My father was a devout Muslim who had designed mosques here in Albania. In 1942, my parents sheltered the Jewish family in our home in Duris and hid them for almost four years between uh, in the, the house that was there and between that house and a seaside home. Those families were the Gerechter family, father, mother, and daughter from Hamburg, Germany. So the Germans, we introduced the Gerechter family as our relatives from Germany. Naturally, they were terrified. After the war, we lost all trace of the Gerechters. The communists took power and forbade contact with anyone from the outside world. My father was arrested in 1944 and the communists killed him. After the fall of communism, we reestablished contact with the daughter now named Johanna Newman and living in the United States in America. Next, please. And this is my third and uh, shot. This man is uh, Rifat Hoxha, not, not related to Enver Hoxha, different Hoxha. That's what he said in his testimony. My father, Nuru Hoxha, was an Iman, a Muslim preacher. In our town of Terbak, there were several Jewish families who had escaped from the Greek city of Yanina, as well as a local Jewish family that lived there. All were sheltered by my father in an underground cellar attached to our house, including the Solomoni family, the Yaseka family, and the Negria Jewish family. Now these three books in Hebrew, prayer books, were left by one of these families through promise that they would return and retrieve them after the war. But the communist regime made it impossible any contacts until recently. Until recently means until when this picture was taken. But I want to add, after this picture was taken, Rifat Hoxha was able to locate a member of one of the families living in Israel, and the Hebrew prayer books were returned to him. And uh, those people that uh, were saved by him, one of them said, we owe our lives and that of our children to Nuro Hoxha. May God reward him with immortality. We bow in respect to his memory. So these prayer books were returned after this picture was taken to one of the families that had left them there. Uh, the Hoxha family kept these prayer books hidden from the communist regime for, for, 40, for over 45 years. Next, please. So at Yad Vashem, we continue to honor Albanian rescuers who saved Jews. And this is one of the ceremonies where I'm about to hand over a medal, which is in that uh, olive box and a certificate of honor to one of the uh, family members who saved Jews, uh, the family of Rezniki. Uh, so I want to finish by saying Albania is the only country that had more Jews at the end of the war than at the beginning of the war. There were 10 times as many Jews at the end of the war. There were like between two to 3,000 than the 200 and 300 that were there at the beginning of the war. That's quite an achievement for a country. There is no parallel like this in any other European country. And as was mentioned by, I believe, by Yael or Samir, these people were not even Albanian citizens. It's not that they were Albanian citizens and they had to be saved. They were strangers. They were immigrants. 
They didn't speak one word of Albanians. They were Jewish in a country which is 85 to 90 percent Muslim. And so, but they were all saved. Maybe with the exception of just one case where uh, a collaborator turned in a Jew to the Germans. And so this is a unique record in the history of the Holocaust, which the Albanians pride themselves with full justice. Thank you. Wonderful. So well, I, would, I would like to add, Olivia, also that the Wallenberg International Foundation uh, uh, for the Albanians is a house of life. And I think this is very becoming uh, that there is recognition of the world jewelry, not only of Israel, uh, for the rescue of Jews. Yeah, I want to add to what Yael just said now, very important. I was associated with the Wallenberg Association for many years. And the Wallenberg Association created a program called House of Life. They went to various places in Europe and a house where Jews were sheltered, especially many Jews, they put on a plaque on the wall of that house. This is a house of life. Here Jews were sheltered. The wonderful project. As Yael mentioned, when it came to Albania, the whole country of Albania was honored as a house of life. So that is really outstanding. Wonderful. So I see there are quite a few questions in the chat box. We will get to your questions in a few moments. Right now, it's my job to, it's my pleasure and job to tell you about our upcoming programs. So next week, we have our final program of the summer. So I'm going to tell you about that program. And I will also tell you about our program a month later at the end of September, which will be our first program of the fall. So next week, we have the very important Jewish leader and hero, Natan Sharansky. He was a political prisoner in Soviet Russia for nine years, of which 405 days he spent in solitary confinement. So he knows what it was to be a political prisoner. He has written a book called Never Alone, Prison Politics and My People. He has co-authored it with Dr. Gil Troy, who's a professor at McGill University. And we will have both Natan Sharansky and Gil Troy here next week uh, in conversation. In addition, we have a glorious film to go along with the Sharansky program. It's called From Slavery to Freedom. And it's a documentary about Sharansky's life. This film is not available on Netflix or Amazon or anywhere else. But if you sign up for next week's program, you will have an opportunity to see it. And in addition, we do have signed autograph copies of the book. So here it is, Never Alone, Prison, Politics, and My People. Uh, we have 18 copies left. So if you want to get one of those 18 copies, you will receive an email after today's program with information on how to order it. Uh, we're uh, selling them at a deep discount. The list price is $30 and we are selling them for $21 and that includes free shipping anywhere in the US. So um, right now we are going to look at a trailer for the film From Slavery to Freedom. My name is Anatoly Sharansky. For three years already, I am fighting for my right to live for Israel. KGB protects the Arabs only because they want to live in Israel, only because they are Jewish. 
уже невозможно было терпеть репрессии, антисемитизм, вранье. Мы заявляем открыто, да, мы не хотим здесь жить, мы хотим жить в Израиле. И майор Белкин закончил допрос мой с такими словами. Эх, при Сталине выбил бы я вам все зубы, и на этом наша беседа бы с вами кончилась. Все первые допросы в основном объясняли мне расстрел неизбежен. Потому что было ясно, что обвинение в шпионаже – смертная казнь. Кто я такой? Меня в этом помещении 40 лет тому назад судили за измену Родины. So please do join us for that very important program and the opportunity to meet Natan Sharansky in person. He will also be taking your questions. So it really is quite a rare opportunity. That is next Sunday. Now, then we will be taking a break for the Jewish holidays. And our first program of the fall will be on Sunday, September 26th. And there we're featuring another major Jewish hero that you may not have heard of. His name is Albi Sachs. Now, Albi Sachs was a Jewish hero of, of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. He's a South African Jew. He fought right alongside Nelson Mandela and others. And he was the victim of an assassination attempt. His car was blown up, he was in the car, he lost an arm and he lost an eye. So he certainly suffered. He was also imprisoned. When Mandela was released in 1990, Albi Sachs also came back from political exile. He had been living in Mozambique. Then Mandela established the new South Africa and he invited Albi Sachs, who was a lawyer, trained as a lawyer, to write the constitution for a new democratic South Africa. Uh, so he did that and he also sat on the Supreme Court of the first democratic South African Supreme Court. So uh, that is someone else you will really want to learn about and he will be with us live in person from South Africa. So that will be at the end of September and you'll have information about that program as well. So again, next week, Sharansky, and at the end of September, we will meet Albi Sachs. So now let's get to your questions. So there are quite a few questions and I'm going to maybe group them a little bit. So somebody asks how many Jews in, well, how many people in total were saved in Albania if somebody knows and were they only Jews and Italians or any other categories? And then another question related to that is how were the Albanian people able to accomplish this? Perhaps it's a different story for each family, or is there some way to generalize? So who would like to take that question? I mean, it's not only Jews and Italians, maybe there were some other people too who were sheltered. You have to understand the idea of sheltering, of helping people who are innocent and are being persecuted for no this is something that uh, uh, Albanians don't like and that they, they oppose that. And then they go out and help these people. So during World War II, the two major groups that were persecuted, first of all, of course, the Jews, but later on, when Italy capitulated and the Germans were very much upset at Italy because Italy was an ally of Germany and then they surrendered, then the Germans turned against the Italian soldiers. So they too had persecuted the Italian soldiers and they needed to be held. So uh, as uh, pointed out by Yael, there were over 20,000 Italian soldiers left in Albania uh, that were being held. And there were like two, 3,000 Jews that happened to be there and uh, they too were held. Mm -hmm. This is as far as statistics, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So maybe Yael wants to add something to that or Samir. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, 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 thank yes. you, Mr. Mordecai. You are correct. Uh, we all need to be well, not at the expense of another suffering. So even today, 
it was a smile for me to, to read on the news that uh, Albanian government was not uh, staying indifferent to Afghan refugees. So they opened and they say they are receiving and trying to organize them and so on, according to uh, international pa partners. That's wonderful. And that was, in fact, one of the other questions, which is about Albania today and the refugee crisis that is still very much with us. I'm trying to answer some question by writing. Happy okay. we are communicating today. Now, this is a question, I think, for Mordechai, which is about numbers. Now, I don't really like us to speak about numbers, but people do ask. So Albania saved about 3,000 Jews, Denmark about 7,000, Bulgaria about 48,000. Tell us a little bit about uh, comparative numbers. Well, well, I want to interfere because if the, if the Minister of Interior, the Albanian Minister of Interior gave a, a permit for 2,000 Jewish families to go to Italy, they must have been 6,000 at least. So we don't know how many more they were in it in uh, Albania. So the number of 3,000, I'm not sure, is, uh, is based on a very solid uh, fact. OK, so I want to say something about Bulgaria and Denmark. Bulgaria did not deliver its own Jews to the Germans. Yes, it's true. But they delivered 13,000 Jews from Macedonia to the Germans. And the other thing is, in 1940, when Bulgaria joined the Axis, they passed what is called the Law for the Defense of the Nation, the anti-Semitic laws. Jews had to wear the yellow star in Bulgaria. Jews did not have to wear the yellow star in Albania. Okay, Jews had to register their possessions. And Jews were then expelled from the major city into smaller cities now in Bulgaria. True enough, Bulgaria refused to deliver its own Jews uh, from Bulgaria proper. So you have to remember the distinction. As far as Denmark, most Danish Jews were not sheltered in Denmark. But the beautiful thing about Denmark, there was a place where one could take them. You had to cross a large river and you were in Sweden. Uh, now this, this was not in, in Albany, uh, Albania, I'm sorry. Uh, Italy is too far away. You can't cross by boats to Italy like you could cross from Denmark into Sweden. So in, if you wanted to save the Jews in Albania, you had to shelter them, you had to hide them. If you wanted to save the Jews in Denmark, you had, simply had to skip them overnight. In a two-week operation, most Jews in Denmark landed in Sweden. So we give thanks to the Danish people and we give thanks to the Bulgarian uh, officials and civic leaders who were opposed to delivering Bulgarian Jews uh, to the Germans. But let's keep the distinction clear about Albania, where the Jews had to be sheltered inside Albania. And I have to add, Albania, the Germans, they installed a collaborationist government, what a man called Deva, who was Minister of Interior. The Germans asked the Minister of Interior to deliver the Jews, to deliver the list of the Jews. Three times, Deva refused to issue the names of the Jews, the list of the Jews, where they are. Now, this is a government which supposedly is on the side of Germany, but is refusing to deliver the Jews and deliver to say where they are, list of names. So this is very unique to Albania. But very somebody unique. points out that in other countries, the Nazis hunted Jews. They went door to door. Did this not also happen in Albania? No, they didn't. But to hunt Jews, you have to know where they are. You, in other words, you can suspect that somebody is a Jew, but there is no definite. You see, the thing is like this. When Germany occupied France, Belgium, and Holland, all Jews had to register with the police. So the Germans, they knew where the Jews are, and they picked them up because Jews had registered. When it comes to Poland, all Jews were first imprisoned in ghettos. So when the Germans decided to liquidate the Jews, all they had to do is pick up all the Jews inside the ghetto, okay? In other words, the victims were available. But in Albania, you had to have the collaboration of the local people in order to find out where these Jews are.
And that didn't happen. So in the film, there's a mention of Albert Einstein, that he passed through Albania for a short period of time. Can someone tell us more about that story? Well, I'm not sure if it is fully uh, based, but I know that the head of the uh, Israel, uh, Israel Albania uh, Friendship uh, yeah. Association, he has some, he's, he claims at least that he has some uh, proofs, and this is a film that still has to be done. And oh. I believe, and I believe that Einstein went to Albania because his uh, Swiss visa has expired, and he was without a visa, and he had to find a shelter. And the king uh, had enabled him to get a uh, passport with a fake name, and with this he went first to France and then to the U.S. I, I believe it is true. May I add something about the numbers? Olivia, yes. do we have time? Go ahead. Uh, the list that I prepared by combining different li lists of other authors, plus my research, they look like this. They have uh, references of uh, archives, names, and so on. They are very detailed uh, lists. Now, these are only the names found on the list, on the document. Not every Jew with his own family or group was registered. Uh, also, many Jews had, the list had the name, one name, and also in brackets, con la familia, with his family. Who knows how many others were with him? Exactly. Yes. In another example, uh, two, two months after the Vansi conference that Mr. Mordecai showed, uh, the German consul went to the Prime Minister Mustafa Merliga and told him in Pristina uh, there are 300 families there, Jewish family from Yugoslavia, uh, deliver them to us. Uh, the Prime Minister Mustafa Mergika Kruja immediately organized his staff to prepare passport documents and buses, went there, put them onto the buses and uh, spread them all over the Albania. So who knows how many are there? At least 300 uh, families. In another case, uh, the interior minister that is part of the film by Yael Katsir, who has not received any title as righteous, in the month of August 1943, when it was a vacuum of power, because the German army is just uh, occupying the ports and sea, <clears throat> sorry, uh, ports and seaports, and Italians had just capitulated and it was a mess, he immediately made a visa and passport with visa for about 2,000 Jews or 2,000 families. Families. So they can move from Albania to Southern Italy because in, at that time, Southern Italy was under allies, allies. They had occupied now the Southern Italy. And one of those was the girl that it was a miracle that Yael, the Ani Alterats found and be part of the film. Because the film had a big challenge. There was no living uh, evidences anymore. So it was a miracle that Yael found Ani Alterats. It was a girl that she uh, traveled by boat from Albania to Italy, to Southern Italy. And it was a miracle that I found the husband of the soldiers that had been in the house of my mother in North Italy and the colleague of Yael went there, recorded her. After three months, she died. So this is the big challenge now for such uh, films. Well, and we have to cherish this. We have to, uh, these good examples, it, it's not Albanian, it's not a small thing. It, it is a subject that belongs to all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Because so there, there is one common thing in all the pictures I have gathered through my friends and so on. Uh, in all pictures, there are smiles. Jews there and their saviors, Albanians, are smiling. And that is the reason we are today, to transmit those echoes of smiling. Because we need smiles today. Even in the tsunami of today, we need smiles for tomorrow. So therefore, I'm very happy to be with you and exchange my thoughts and what I know, what I have researched and so on. So I'm very happy that I met uh, Yael and we did this. We, even with my friend uh, Petrit in uh, Tehran and so on. We well, made bravo. It. bravo on a very important project and film. Thank you, so, thank you. Yael, tell me what final words you would like to say to our audience, please. Well, I think that Samir had expressed it uh, even better than I would have dreamt of, but I can only say that the story has to be told all over the place, in schools, in gatherings, in uh, on every Memorial Day of the Holocaust, because it is not self evident it's not taken for granted that people will help and people will stretch a hand uh, for the needy and for the persecuted. And we have to learn from the Albanians a great deal. This is all I can say. We still have to be more modest and learn, learn. This is uh, my uh, conclusion. And I thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the program. And I'm working now on a film on my father-in-law who was assassinated by the Japanese terrorists at the Lud airport. And I think that there, there, were, there was no mercy. There was no rachmunes, as we say in Yiddish, uh, for anyone. I mean, like the pulled out their guns and they started to shoot all over. So uh, my father-in-law was a very, very famous scientist. And you know that uh, NASA uh, named one of the craters on the moon after him as a Professor Katsir Kachalski. Uh, his brother became president uh, because, uh, because he was supposed to be the president and he took his place. He was also a scientist. And uh, I feel that it is very important to learn from those who have given the world, not those who have taken from the world something. And the Albanians have given us, first of all, they have given a lot of lives. And secondly, they've set a Set an example, I guess you're trying to say. Thank you, Yael. Mordechai, what would you like to say to our audience? Well, what would I like to say? I, I worked on the Righteous Program at Yad Vashem for 24 years. And under my supervision, we honored people from uh, all countries in Europe, all of them, who saved Jews. Very interesting, when we asked the rescuers what motivated you? Why did you risk your life to save Jews? None of them gave philosophical answers. None of them said, it's because I read Hegel and I read Kant and I read Rousseau and I read all these philosophies and I decided I wanted to help out. No, they all gave answers which uh, seemed uh, not satisfactory. They all said, well, it was a natural thing to do. We just happened to be there and we needed, they needed help and we helped them. So that's very interesting. Uh, yes, the Albanians said, uh, I believe in the Quran and in the Quran we have to help each other and so on. But I don't think that's the true answer. So I wanna say here, you know, we have a lot of the thinking, the Western thinking by Thomas Hobbes, Sigmund Freud, who say that man is basically an aggressive being and man only cares for himself and not for others. And here you have examples from the Albanians that they cared for others more than they cared for themselves. So this seems like a contradiction. Mr. Sigmund Freud, what would you say to that? Uh, and so 
we don't know what the answer is. You know, there's a lot of talk about the banality of evil and the mystery of goodness. Well, evil is not banal, evil is terrible, and goodness may not be such a big mystery. It's a potential with that exists in every person. It can happen. And as I said, you don't have to be a great philosopher to become a good person. You don't have to be an altruist to become. You don't have to be a Mother Teresa. You don't have to make, you can do an act of goodness. And an act of small act of goodness with, by saving a human life, this is the greatest act. So it's beyond, I think, of uh, being a Muslim or things like that. Look, in Iraq in 1941, there was a Farahut. Uh, people had lived in Iraq for 2000 years, and yet in 1941, there was a pogrom against Jews in Farahut. And that's in an Islamic country. So I think what the Albanians, what's so beautiful about the Albanians, I find, I find is not necessarily that they saved uh, 3,000 Jews. What I find is that they were sheltering 20,000 Italian soldiers, and that's very unusual. Could you imagine that after France was liberated in 1944, that the French people would be hiding German soldiers on their soil, their former occupiers? I mean, after all, the Italians destroyed Albanian independence. Mussolini conquered uh, Albania, exiled the king. Why would the Albanians now shelter the Italian soldiers? But they did that because they were persecuted. They were innocent, these soldiers. So this is something very unique about the Albanians. It has to do with the Albanian psyche, I believe. So my last words is, I say to all the Albanians, please don't stop being Albanians. Continue to be like that and show the world, give an example that it can be otherwise. You can do acts of goodness and you don't have to be a great philosopher and you don't have to be a great thinker and you don't have to be a great believer and you can do acts of goodness. So continue, but stay like this, don't change because we need more people like the Albanians in today's world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are absolutely correct, thank you. Good. Thanks to our illustrious panel. Thank you for all of you for spending another fabulous hour with us. I thought it was fabulous. And please join us again next week for Natan Sharansky and the film From Slavery to Freedom. See you next time, everybody. Bye-bye.